Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Art Money Success Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Brophy, and we are talking about painting murals. And today I am bringing on a muralist who has been painting murals for a living for 10 years. His name is Austin Sepulveda, and Austin is out of Austin, Texas. His website is osten-art.com, and I will put a link to it in the show notes. Austin has told me that he's an open book, so I'm going to ask him any question I want, and you know I'm going to be asking the questions you want to know. So let's bring him on. Hey, Austin, welcome. Hey, how's it going? Good. Thank you so much for being here. And just to give my listeners the uh, cliff notes of your background, basically, Austin has been a professional muralist for 10 years, and he's painted things like nurseries, apartment complexes, buses, and everything in between. So what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions that my listeners are going to know the answers to. So we're going to talk about things like how to get a mural project, how you... Um, how you've gotten to where you are. Um, we're also going to talk about going full time as an artist. What I understand in your email to me was that you went 100% full time a year ago and you just had a baby recently. So these are two huge life changing events that really affect each other, in my opinion and my experience. And I'm going to ask you about insurance and projects that have gone bad and all kinds of stuff. So I hope um, you are ready to just like throw it all out there. Oh, yeah, I'm ready to go. <laughs> OK, so my first question is, is Austin your real name? Yes. My, well, it's spelled the way that the city is spelled. But when I first got into doing graffiti, which is ultimately what led me to doing murals, um, all my friends had, you know, really cool tag names and I couldn't think of anything that I really liked that much. So I just started spelling my name kind of funny and it stuck and people started recognizing me as that. And when I started selling art, it was what I was writing on my canvases and it just never, never went away. And so it's, you know, it's kind of unique and people usually remember it. So you, so when you sign your work, you sign it O-S-T-E-N. Yes. Okay, got it. Well, that's great. I mean, it, it totally works. It's you're lucky you you figured that out. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I say that because I know a lot of artists just really agonize, especially if they have a very common name like Mike Johnson. Like they agonize over what do I call myself so that I can get, you know, a website and you know the uh, handles on Instagram and all that stuff. Um, okay, so. You have painted giant things and small things and buses. And so what's the biggest wall you've ever painted? The biggest wall I've done so far is uh, 30 by 28. So it was the side of uh, an apartment complex. Um, we've got a couple more in the works later this year that actually I think are going to be a little bit larger than that even. But um, so far, that's about the range that I found to be the most um, convenient as one person to paint. Um, you know, you can get into getting a bunch more people and bringing all that kind of stuff in, which is what I'm going to be doing in the future. But I really like to do all of it and be able to do something really big and put my name on it. And, uh, yeah, so that's pretty much the size that I aim for when I'm looking for new murals and stuff as well. Yeah. Well, and that was one of the questions I was going to ask you about hiring people to help. We've done that with bigger projects over the years just because painting murals is very physical work oh yeah it's very physical and if you're up on a lift you're high up and you left something down there that you need um wouldn't it be nice to have somebody on hand that can just like send it up to you oh yeah you know just practical things like that um we're filling in, you know, what we've done is uh, Drew's hired people to help. I, we we have so many people that offer to help him for free. Right. And I, and I never let people do it for free. Same. I, 
And the reason I don't tell me if this is your reason too, is because when you're not paying someone, they tend to not take it as seriously. They might not show up on time or might not show up at all, leave early. Their girlfriend shows up with beer, you know, they, they don't see it as a job because they're not getting paid. And for the artist, it is a job. It's a job right. for a client. So, you, I mean, what's what's your reason for not letting people do it for free? Um, I, I mean, anything I do, I like to be paid for. So I assume most other people do too, you know, and yeah. a lot of artists, yeah. myself included, when I was younger, I would do stuff for free for the opportunity, which sometimes is great, you know, and you do learn stuff from doing that. But ultimately, if your goal is to get paid, you're going to get better work out of people. They're going to be more respectful. You're, everyone's just going to you know, flow a lot easier if everyone has something that's kind of in it for them as well. True. Yeah, absolutely. I know. And I'm like that, too. I never like to get anything for free from people, especially artists, because that goes against my value system. Right. <laughs> and like I just had a solo show um, last month and one of my buddies was playing live music for it and he was trying to not let me pay him the whole time. And so he had like a tip jar out and I just put all of his money in the tip jar and was like, too bad you get paid. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, and I love how you're willing to help people. And you told me, you know, in your email that you want to help artists and that you often help artists. And I love that because um, the world needs more of that because the art business is so challenging. And if you're somebody who figured a few things out or a lot of things out, I mean, it's, you just make other people's lives easier. So thank you for doing uh, that. Absolutely. I know that's something that I always, and the truth is a lot of people, you know, they get kind of weird about sharing secrets or, you know, stuff that they're doing in the industry. But I find that a lot of people don't even do it anyway. So like, you know, people ask for advice or they want to know how you did this or that. And, you know, I, most of the time, the truth is it's consistency and going out there and talking to people. And a lot of people don't do that. So like, I'm more than willing to help anybody that wants to listen or wants to try because it is, it's a really hard thing to do, but you can do it. It's not, there's no crazy secret that's going to unlock all of the doors, you know? So I, right. I wish there was somebody when I was starting out to kind of guide me at least, because you're going to make mistakes and we all do. But when you learn from them or you have somebody that's a little more knowledgeable to help you get through those, that's always, always better. Yeah. And there's no magic bullet. And that is, that is really true. Um, People are always looking for the easy way out. Like, how do I get a mural job without talking to people? Um, you can't really. No. You kind of have to talk to people. You, <laughs> you also can't. have to have murals <laughs> to show them what you're capable of doing, too. So, like, I feel like that's a some people have a hard time with that, too. Where And I did also where, like, you know, you know your capabilities as an artist and you know you're capable of something. But it's really hard to show somebody that unless you've done it. So... Absolutely. Yeah. Because if I have money and I want to hire somebody to paint a mural and there's three artists I'm trying to choose from, I'm really going to choose the one that I have the most confidence in. And that's what it is. It's the confidence. I could have this artist say, I'll do it for really cheap, but I have no confidence in that person. I don't want to hire them and take a chance of them messing it up. I'd rather hire, hire somebody that I know has experience. And how do you know that by seeing what they've done in the past? Yeah, that's why I always tell people to, to start, start out with a few murals under your belt. So how did you get started painting um, murals? So I started, my mom was really awesome when I was a little kid. So she let me paint all over the walls in my room. So I started when I could hold a brush, you know. Um, I couldn't paint in the rest of the house, but my room was my canvas. And so that's how I started doing them. And then people notice as you get older and I stuck with art my whole life, I've never stopped doing art. That's one of the, you know, main foundations of who I am. And so you meet people over the years, you start doing, I started doing graffiti and stuff like that. So I got really into doing large pieces of art and murals is the way that you make money from doing huge art. And um, I started with a church at one point. I did their whole nursery. 
um, when I was like maybe 15. Um, then once I, you know, got older, got out of high school, I started selling art. I started doing live painting for concerts and stuff like that. And then with that, you start meeting the people at venues, you start meeting all kinds of different people. And my first uh, professional mural was when I was 18. And it was from somebody that I met because I was live painting for Slightly Stupid. And they bought my art after the show and came up to me and they had a smoke shop and said, hey, we would love if you painted the whole shop. And I was like, I'm in. And once it was, you know, once that started happening, it was kind of like, you do make something really, really large and get to see your art huge somewhere and you get paid for it. You're like, I need more of this. <laughs> yeah. So there's so many nuggets of information in that whole thing you just said. And one thing I want to point out is you getting out and doing things around people, live, meeting people. I always tell people this, you, 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 mm, can't grow as big. You can't expand hiding away in your house or in your room. You have to get out and meet people and doing those live paintings is incredible because there's so much energy in, in a situation like that. You own all the people and the excitement and that that's amazing. So um, when you painted that first painting for the church, you were 15 years old. Mm -hmm. Did you get paid for that? No, that one I did not get paid for. And, you know, it was it was OK. I was 15. I was, yeah. you know, and even after that, like I've done some murals um, in the past, too, where it's just something that I really want to do. And we have some walls here where I live that we paint all the time. We have big paint jams where we bring mural artists in from Austin, San Antonio, sometimes out of state and get together and all paint stuff. So like. I try not to say that doing stuff for free is always bad because yeah. it kind of is the intention that you go into it with, you know, if yeah. you're going into it to learn, to try something new, you may not want to get paid for that job because you might not know how it's going to come out and reflect on you as an artist as well. Well, that's a good point. And especially in the very beginning, when you're learning, you're going to want to do things for, I mean, obviously you're not going to charge the same as somebody who's been doing it for 10 years because your experience level is not there and you're probably going to make some mistakes, probably going to make a lot of mistakes. Right. Um, gosh, I, I, we made a lot of mistakes and still, you know, you still make mistakes even after 10, 20 years. Yeah. Um, because you find new things to mess up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just stupid things like, right. Yeah, just stupid things like not knowing there's some something on the wall that the paint's not sticking to, even though right. you thought you cleaned it off properly and you thought it was ready to paint. We had that happen before. That was a nightmare. What was one of your biggest mistakes in painting a mural or the biggest challenges? Um, one of the biggest challenges, uh, I'm trying to think. The biggest mistake would probably be like early on when I was, um, I wouldn't really lay out what I was going to do for people as far as like, I wouldn't give them good expectations um, for my process, for what I was going to be using, for, you know, all the things that you kind of learn as you go along the way by messing them up. Um, but I think the biggest challenge in the beginning was trying to get people to see me as a professional artist who deserves to get paid for what they're doing. And I found that the art wasn't actually the thing that helped me do that. It's the whole business side of things where you, you know, you give them a good expectation. You write it out and lay it out to them exactly what your process is, how you do it, what your payment schedules are, all that stuff just ends up making things way easier for everyone in the long run. But I think it's also probably the hardest thing to do as a new mural artist. Yeah. Yeah, it is because you're you're still figuring out your process and everything. Um, that's why my uh, I have a mural proposal and pricing template um, product, and I've been selling that thing for quite a few years, and it it helps people so much because it's all laid out. Um, so when you give somebody a price quote and a proposal, are you tell me tell me about that process? 
Um, so I have my stuff worked out right now to a square footage price. So okay. I know what it's going to cost me to paint, you know, a certain wall, depending on the square footage that it is. That I found, it doesn't work for everybody, but most of the other mural artists I talk to, we all kind of do the same thing. Um, some people might be more expensive, some a little cheaper, but it's a good way for you to kind of know if I'm going to paint, let's just say a 10 by 10 wall, I know how much paint I'm going to need. I know no matter what we decide to paint, if you know your style and the way that you work, you're comfortable with that number. Um, that makes it easy for the client too, in case maybe that's too expensive for them. So maybe they want to do a little bit smaller wall, or maybe they realize that it's not as expensive as they thought, and now they want to do their whole building. But I find that that way is a lot easier for everybody to kind of understand. And do you require them to pay a deposit up front? Yes. Um, I actually have kind of a, an interesting payment schedule that I do. Um, I had a welding company before, and so I transferred a lot of the things that I did from my welding company over to my murals because it's the same business, You're working with clients, got to have payment schedules. Um, I do a 25% deposit up front to start drawings. Um, that way I'm compensated for all my drawings and everything. Um, then once we get done with the drawings and they're happy, we have a start date in mind, then I do a um, deposit of 50% of the remaining total. So that will cover all my materials as well as labor and everything that's going into it while I'm doing the mural. Yeah. And then I get the final at the end, which is a little bit less, like most people get 50% at the end. So they're yeah. making the same amount, but I kind of like to stay ahead of that because yeah. sometimes things get a little hairy or sometimes, you know, you wind up with clients that are kind of sketchy or you, yeah. you don't want to be waiting at the end of the mural. Like you already did all the work. Like, I feel like you should have like 60 to 70% of the money by the time you're done. So you're not left with the bag at the end. I think that is a brilliant way to do it. Absolutely. Because sometimes do, clients do. Yeah. But I, I find that if a client's willing to pay a deposit up front and pay another deposit when you start, um, 99% of them are going to pay you in full at the end because they're already a qualified client with money. They have no problem paying you. It's the clients that refuse to pay a deposit up front are the ones that you absolutely cannot trust. And they're the ones to really look out for. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I know that this artist friend of mine who actually she's one of my my clients, she painted this giant mural out in Arizona. This never got a deposit she spent a ton of money on the materials and renting a lift and all that stuff oh, no. and the guy never paid her months and months went by she was just she wasn't she, it was so emotional for her she didn't sleep she got anxiety like she was thinking about quitting being an artist and i said why are you letting this one creepy guy like ruin your life why don't you just right. go paint, just go paint over it Go, yeah. go there in the middle. Of the, and she did. She went yeah. there at night and painted over the entire wall. Good for her. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's her wall. You never got paid for it. Like, That's right. I've had some crazy, crazy things like that happen. I had one place um, that I did some really, really cool drawings. It's a Hawaiian. I won't say the name of it, but it's a Hawaiian restaurant here in Texas that was opening. And it was when I still wasn't really, you know, well-rounded as a business muralist. And um, they asked me to do some drawings for them. And they were talking to a few other artists. I did some really cool drawings that I loved. And they decided to go with another artist. And then I see on their Instagram a month later, my art is on their wall that they hired somebody no. else to paint. Oh, and my gosh. I was, uh, I was not happy, <laughs> to say the least. But so, you learn, you know, this, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is great. I'm glad you told us this story because this is why I tell people to write their copyright notice on their sketches. So when you have someone that, you know, they're paying you the 25% up front to create the sketches, they don't own those sketches. They can't hire somebody else to come and paint it you have to make that very clear. And I'm, I know you probably do now, but oh, I'm yeah. just saying this for the audience. Like, this is why I tell you to write your copyright notice on your sketch. And that's the little C with a circle around it. And you can just write on there. You can even do it by hand. 
artwork copyright owned by and then your name. So it's very clear. Oh, that's such oh, a bummer. Yeah. I yeah, would there's there, it, it wasn't it wasn't good. Um, I wasn't happy. <laughs> but it's one of those things that you know it you learn from it if yeah. you're doing it right and you say, okay, how do I never let this happen again? Now it's in my contracts. It's in I don't do sketches anymore unless I'm getting paid for them. And one of the other yeah. things I've actually heard from other mural artists that people will do is have an artist come out and look at the space and ask them for all of their ideas. And that's something that it's kind of the same thing. You need a deposit if you're going to go out and if you're talking about someone's place and ideas and all that stuff, you need to be compensated in some way for it, or they'll just take your ideas. Well, and your time is money. And one thing that successful people know that the rest of us had to learn the hard way every hour of your time is valuable and if you don't value your time nobody else will and when you waste your time you're losing money and as the father of a new baby <laughs> your money is way more important now than ever because now you have this child and your wife to take care of and so that was how I always looked at it when my 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 baby's 20 years old now, but when he was little and then we raised our niece also, who's 21 now. Um, but when they were little, I always looked at it like people asking Drew to do things for free or for super cheap as taking food out of our baby's mouths yeah. and taking money away from their college fund and their vacations and, and everything. Um, yeah. and if you don't have children, you know, you can use that same, that, that same thinking for yourself, for your future, for your puppies. I don't know your parents. <laughs> right. Right. Um, why, why lose money? And yeah. Lose it's, time? Just, it's, it's kind of weird that there is this like notion that artists are very passive and will like do stuff because they have an opportunity to, which is that all those things are really nice. And, you know, you should be grateful for all the opportunities that you get, but you also don't have to do something just because somebody asked you. And when you, like you said, when you start looking at it that way of like, my time is valuable, what I'm doing is important. It's for my family. It's a lot easier to talk to people too. You have like a little bit more of a confidence of like, there is a reason I'm doing this and yeah. I'm not just painting just to paint, which is totally fine too. And I know a lot of artists that, you know, they kind of get into this and ask me, you know, questions here and there about stuff and kind of realize that maybe they're not interested in the that business side of art and that they just want to do it as a hobby. And that's totally cool, too. You know, like it's not, so much easier. Yeah. Not everyone has to <laughs> do this crazy thing for a living. <laughs> right. It, it is so much easier to just do it in your spare time than to try to make a living at it. And, it, and it's a certain personality type. You, you really, so you don't look like a businessman. So for, right. for those of you listening where you can't see Austin, he just looks like this cool dude that you'd hang out with and drink beer with. And he's probably skateboarding to his mural projects. And I don't know what else he do for fun, but does not look like a businessman at all. And you're, you, you look young. I don't know how old you are. How old are you? Uh, 28. 28 years old. Okay. You're just a little puppy. Yep. And, um, <laughs> but you have an entrepreneurial uh, mindset, which is a willingness to learn how to deal with the business and things. And so that's, that's part of what it takes is being yeah. willing to learn how to do those things that are hard. And that kind of segues into um, what I want to go into a little bit more is how you find mural jobs now. Like what is your, I, I'm going to assume you have a lot that come to you now that you have this reputation. Do you go out and actively solicit mural projects? Yeah. Um, so yes to all of the above. Um, I have a lot of people that come to me now because of word of mouth, you know, once you start doing stuff, people start to recognize that that's what you do and they know who to call for it. Um, but there's downtime still, you know, like you're saying on the last podcast, I think summertime is the time for murals. And 
that's true. Um, winter time, not as much, but what you can do and people don't like it, but what I do a lot of times when we're down, I'll drive around and go look for places that are under construction, new strip centers, new office buildings going up. All those places have dollar signs to me because those are all new businesses. They all need something to help liven them up. You're not going to get every single job, but you get way more than you would expect. Like there's days where I've gone around and, you know, talked to 20, 30 different businesses and not gotten anything. And then there's days where I've gone around and I've got 20 or, you know, I've got six months worth of work lined up. So, okay. So you're not a shy guy. No. In the beginning, was it hard for you to go knock on somebody's door and say, Hey, I want to paint a mural. Yes. Yes. It's, one of those things, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And I still get nervous. Like I still am driving up to places and I'm like, oh no, I got to go talk to these people. And then you just put on your artist face and go in there and you get it done. You know, like no one's going to know you're doing murals unless you tell them. All right. So let's break it down for somebody who wants to follow this process. So you're driving around town and you see that there's a new building being constructed and maybe it's being finished and you think that's a perfect place for a mural. How do you find out the right person to talk to? Generally, they'll have either a sign that says what's going up. And if they have that, then you can go to their website and just send an email to every single email that you see. You may not know, like if you're just starting this out, it's going to be hard to find. And it's different for everybody too, right. because one company might have a salesperson that handles that stuff. Another company might have an interior designer that they're planning on working with that now you have to call her. So it's a lot of um, research, a lot of calling people, a lot of cold emails, a lot of, it's a lot of work, like really is. Yeah and being creative too like um for newer artists that are coming out trying to do murals right now i would really recommend using the app thumbtack i don't know if you've heard of that yeah i have heard of it yes. um it's it's only good for murals really <laughs> really is what i've learned from it is that you can get a lot of really good mural work out of it and you do have to pay for it um it's not like a subscription or you pay per lead so that can be you know, it can be kind of hard sometimes if you pay, it's not a lot, it's, you know, 10, $20 maybe. Um, but if you get four or five of them and you've paid all that money and not gotten one, that can be, you know, kind of disheartening, but yeah. I've gotten way more work than not off of that app. Um, especially when I was first starting out, that's where I got a lot of people because you get a lot of people that are you know, young families or they're starting a new business and they want somebody to come add art to it. They're not looking to pay somebody a hundred thousand dollars for right. it either, but you're also not a hundred thousand dollar mural artist yet. So you got to take what you can get. And then that'll give you, you know, the pictures and the murals to show other people. Like I do this, look, yeah. here's my work. So that's a great suggestion. That is a really great suggestion. And yeah, I, I think thumb, thumb Thumbtack is, you know, lower end, but it's great for people starting out. Um, okay, so then once you get the person and they show an interest, then what's your next step? Do you make sure? Do you make sure you talk to them on the phone? That's what I was about. My next step is oh. you get them on the phone immediately. Um, I try to and talk to everybody on the phone, or depending on who the client is. Like when I do apartment complexes, I like to meet them in person. Um, I want to look them in the eye and shake their hand and make sure that they, you know, they know who I am. We have a good rapport and that we can move forward. Um, that's just for larger, you know, contracts and stuff like that. But everybody, you want to get on the phone, learn about them, make them feel super important. Um, how you know, do you make them feel super important? Uh, I just ask them a lot of questions about themselves, you know, um, like just what? keep ask, asking, um, like, I guess if they, someone call or someone has a new business, generally I'll ask them maybe why they started the business or what excites them about it. Um, where they're from, what the, you know, the determining factor of how they want the place to look just like stuff to try to, a lot of people, when you get them on the phone are a little, um, shy. And so I think those like easier questions, just like what excites you about your business? What are you doing it for? Who That's are you? Brilliant. That's brilliant because when we often forget when we're making a call 
to someone that we want to sell something to. We forget that we shouldn't be talking about ourselves the whole time. We right. need to talk about them because that puts them at ease. It makes them feel understood and feel heard and creates this warm connection and starts a, almost like a friendship. If you show interest and people are like that in general, if you show interest in them and then you get them talking about something that excites them, like their new business, their new building, of course, they're excited about it. Right. Where did you where did you learn how to do that? Um, well, a lot of it was from welding. Um, when I was had my welding business, I was talking to homeowners, contractors, just all kinds of different people. And I've always been good at talking to people that I know but I was never as good at talking to people that I didn't know, especially people with a lot of money that I wanted some of. <laughs> um, and so I think that being forced into doing it kind of, you just have to do it and you're going to be bad at it at first. Like yeah. you're, you are, but if that's what you want to do, then you kind of realize this is something I'm going to have to do and I have to get comfortable doing it and it's going to take work and, watch YouTube videos and, you know, you can do sales, there's sales courses, there's all kinds of stuff online that like, you know, once you realize that art as a business, that art is a small part of that, you realize, okay, I got to get really good at all these other things really fast. I put a lot of that in my book, Art Money Success, because that is something that I had to learn because I was sh painfully shy the first 25 years of my life. And I really had to learn how to talk to people, especially when I got into the art business. I thought, you know, I really got to get over this, this social anxiety that I have. And not that I've gotten over it, but I've just learned to take action despite the anxiety. Right. I still get social anxiety. I still get it. I think I just have more confidence now because I'm, you know, with practice, you get things get easier. Right. Like my wife always asks before I go paint a mural, she's like, are you nervous? And I'm like, yeah, every time, no matter what, like, I know I can do it and I'm excited to do it. It doesn't go away. Like you said, you just get better at managing it and doing what you're going to do. Like the more you do anything, it'll be a lot easier. And once you learn about people too, you realize they're just like, no one's this like person that's above you. You know, you can talk to everybody like a normal person and they Everyone likes that. They do. That's true. And we all we all tend to care about the same things. Right. Food, food our families, <laughs> you know, I, people are kind of the same to when you get down to the core. Um, so let's talk about insurance for a minute. What do you do for insurance? Do most of your clients require that you have insurance or do you say, I'm leaving it up to you to have insurance and um, what kind of insurance? So, um, so I carry general liability insurance just as a practice because in case something, it's not that expensive, first of all, it's like yeah. 70 bucks a month or something. It's nothing. Um, so I keep that. And then if they require anything beyond that, then I make sure that we write that in the contract that they'll have, they'll be in, you know, in charge of paying for the insurance. And I have actually had an issue with this before because I had an apartment complex that required me to have commercial auto insurance, which is kind of ridiculous that huh. I'm a one person, but it's, it's their requirements. And I didn't think about this ahead of time. I added it into the quote, but I didn't add enough of it into the quote. I was just going to cancel it when I was done, but I didn't add enough of it into the quote to have it being paid for the whole time. And then what happened at the end was they wanted me to do another mural at another location. So I was like, Oh, well, I'll just keep the insurance. They told me I could add it to the next mural no problem. Well, three months later, still no mural at the next location. I've been paying $350 a month for three months. They say, you know, hey, we're still not sure when we're going to be ready for this. Now I'm out, you know, that much money. So to yeah, me, like that, over a thousand dollars. Yeah, it, it was a it was a tough lesson. But now what I do is when I have a client that requires insurance, I set you know, this is going to be the amount of time that we're working. This is, you know, I'm going to have this insurance that y'all will be required to pay for, but I'm going to cancel it after that. 
if you'd like to do another mural later, we can, you know, renegotiate and discuss, but yeah. that way I don't get in, you know, I don't end up with a $1,200 bill after the fact that you're just sitting there like, man, this insurance thing is tough. Yeah. Well, three fifty a month for general life or for um, commercial auto. That's, and if you were in California, it'd be about 700 a month. Just yeah. So you know. <laughs> right. Everything's like double here. Yeah. Um, so general liability insurance, where do you get your general liability insurance? Um, I have mine through Byberk, which is a Berkshire Hathaway company. Um, they're that pretty like, large. What's that? Is, is that for specifically for artists or just businesses in general? They're just a general, you know, a lot of uh, contractors and stuff work with them. And I actually ended up getting them specifically because they were the only ones that carried the type of commercial auto insurance that I was required to have for that job. Okay. And so they were the company that I ended up going with. Um, as far as general liability insurance, like I'm sure there's some insurance person out there right now, you know, that's like, you don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> but um, in general, it's just to cover you for, you know, it usually covers up. I think mine covers up to like $2 million in damages. And um, also in case they don't like it or, you know, there's so many things that can come up, but I found that somebody, that covers if somebody everything. gets hurt, like if right. a bucket of paint hits somebody in the head. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Um, General liability is usually good. Um, I haven't had anybody else ask for anything more than that. I try not to put too much stuff on the client um, unless it's included in my price. Yeah. Like, I don't really want to be like, hey, you need to go get insurance. I'll just say, yeah. I'll get the insurance, but you're just going to pay for it. Yeah. Because I'm offering a service, right? I don't want them to like, if you were doing a tile floor, you wouldn't tell the client to go get the grout and then you'll do the rest of it. Right. right? True. True. And I think if you're, you know, for a full-time muralist, that makes sense. I think for artists who just paint like two murals a year. Right. And, you know, they're not, you know, a lot of artists tend to charge not enough, I think. Just, you know, a lot of them just are barely making money. Like there's this great muralist in town, this girl who gets hired to do a lot and she does it for so cheap. And I know she doesn't have any insurance, like, because there's no, she's, she and I have talked about pricing and right. I mean, she's barely covering her costs. She just likes seeing her art on these big walls and um, there's just no wiggle room in there. But I would think, you know, a lot of businesses probably have insurance that cover everything that happens on their premises. So, and I think it's different from state to state to state. So I really, always kind of shy away from giving people advice on insurance for me, because I have a brick and mortar. I have an art gallery here in San right. Clemente. I have to have general liability insurance. It's required by my landlord and it's just smart because mm -hmm. somebody walks through my door and they trip and hurt themselves. I mean, I don't want to get sued. So, um, but I would think most, most artists that are just doing an occasional mural, they're probably not going to spend that kind of money, but, um, and I would say I've yeah. never used mine before. So if you're only doing one or two a year, I would never tell somebody not to get insurance, but you don't necessarily need it. If you're doing a couple murals a year, yeah. you know, it's more if you're like doing murals full time where I'm doing murals every single week, you know, sometimes two or three in a week. And so for me, it's like, I don't, I try to keep myself as well protected as I can. Yeah. Smart. Um, so I noticed you have your phone number on your website. Yes. Yay. I always tell artists to do that and nobody ever listens to me. So I didn't do that until I read your book and I was <laughs> like, oh my God, that's, why would I not do that? That's so silly. I don't have my <laughs> number on my website. So Thank well, you. <laughs> well, good. Thank you for listening to my advice. I appreciate it. And you know, well, my my theory is people over forty still use the phone, and a lot of people, especially the ones that have big projects going on, they don't have time to send you an email and 
and wait for you to respond. They want to talk to somebody right now. They're on the job. They want an answer now. And so I answer my phone every time it rings. And, uh, and it's great because I've had so many people say, thank you for answering. Yes. <laughs> I was like, well, this is, this is my business. Of course, I'm going to answer my phone. Right. And that's like one of the first, I mean, and that's somebody's first impression of you too, right? Like if their first impression is that you don't answer your phone, it's not necessarily bad, but it's not as good as if you just answer your phone and say, Hey, what's going on? Um, I found that the more professional you appear, <laughs> maybe not physically, but you know, as an artist, the easier it is to make those jobs. Cause kind of like you were saying earlier, like I'm only 28 and a lot of the people that hire me, I may not even be the best artist that is looking to do the mural, but all of my stuff is very well wrapped up. I have good proposals. I have good invoices. I have, good estimates, you know, insurance, all that kind of stuff. And so they ultimately end up going with somebody who maybe, you know, there's another artist that could be even better, but they're not as well-rounded as a business. And so you can win out on jobs just by being good at communication and appearing and having all of those things to kind of help you. Yeah. Communication is so important because it gives your client confidence and trust in you. And I, I found that, you know, while money is important to a lot of the clients, it's not the most important thing. Right. For especially for bigger companies, they want something done right. They don't want to deal with bullcrap drama or inexperienced people. They right. want to they want to know that you can come in, get the job done. And when you leave, you leave it clean and neat without cigarette butts all over the ground. Right. <laughs> or paint can caps or overspray or all the, like with murals, you know, you learn something new every time you do one, yeah. but there's so many things that are just little that you pick up along the way, like making sure there is no overspray if you're using spray paint or like a large paint sprayer or anything like that. You don't, a lot of people don't realize there's paint particles that float around in the air. So if you're inside and you're using spray paint, you have to have like an air filter that's filtering the air so that you don't end up with little blue and pink dots all over their floor or their countertops, or yeah. it can even get up into other rooms through the AC vents that you don't know about. There's just a lot of stuff that as you grow and do more, you learn every day. Like, and you mean like if you're using spray paint? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I like to use spray paint a lot. It's a really, really fun medium. So I try to use it as much as I can, but I also like, I do a lot of canvas work and stuff too. So I like using brushes as well, but. What brand spray paint do you use? Um, I have all different kinds. This is my favorite though. Um, I think, I think Drew uses this too, the, um, uh, Montana 94. Yeah. It's yeah, like the the best mural paint that I found. Uh, Cobra makes really good paint too. Um, the Rust-Oleum is not very good for doing art. You, that's what I started out using, doing graffiti and stuff like that. You can get it done, but it's this paint right here is like, it's the best. Yeah, yeah, it holds up really well. What do you do? Do you do anything to seal your outdoor paintings? It depends. Uh, it's an extra charge that I add on if people would like to do it. Most people don't for whatever reason. Um, the Montana 94 is really good paint. It's it even shows it on the thing. Like it has like a UV rating and weatherproofing and stuff. Um, I have it as an extra and no one's done it before. No one wants it. I'm not sure why. Um, I, I think it looks kind of weird sometimes. I've seen a couple mm. artists in Austin do it. And it. I know you can get the kind that's matte, but the glossy one gives it, it if it's outside, the sun's going to be on it all the time. And what's really nice about the 94 is that their colors are all matte. So yeah. they show up really well, even when the sun's hitting them directly. Yeah. Well, I asked about that because we did a mural in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina in 2012. Mm -hmm. And it was a, I think the wall was about, 
think it was 60 feet long. Was it 30 feet long? Anyway, it was huge, yeah. huge. And now looking at it all these years later, it's faded quite a yeah. bit. And I, and I, and it kills me to see it so faded. And I think, gosh, I wonder if it would have held up a lot better if we had sealed it with like an extra UV coating. Right. But, but that client, you know, she only wanted to spend a certain amount of money and she probably wouldn't have done it anyway. Um, yeah, see, I think that's a lot of artists run into that same problem, though, where you might have an idea for something or a way that you could ensure it to last 100 years, but the client's just uninterested in that, or yeah. they have already spent the money that they want to spend. And that's kind of hard, too, sometimes, because I've had some people before, you know, be like, oh, you should have re like replastered that whole wall. And I'm like, no. <laughs> No. <laughs> Ideally, I would have had a completely different textured wall, but that's not what the client has. That's not what they, so like you do have to work with the client in some aspects, like you're, especially doing murals, you're not always going to have like prime perfect conditions, especially even weather wise, you know, like it might be kind of windy that day. So you need to either tell your client, Hey, we can't paint today because the wind's too high. Or if they're in a rush and they need it by Tuesday, you're going to, you know, I'm going to get what I can done today, but I may have to come back later because you need it done in this time frame. but you're going to have to pay for me to come back in order to do it because time is money and it's, you know, you got to kind of watch out for yourself with a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. So when it comes to like wall prep, do you require that the wall is ready to paint? Generally speaking, yes. Um, there's been a couple instances where I haven't because I don't think that they would know how to do the right thing. Like I've had a couple spaces where the the paint that was on the wall previously is like peeling off and you're not going to get all of it off, right? And power washing it isn't necessarily going to help, but you're going to have to get out there and sand it. And there's times where I don't trust that they're going to hire somebody to sand it properly, or they're going to do a minimal job and just knock off a couple chips. And then it's going to have problematic areas later where I want to make sure and charge for it, you know, yeah. but you know, if the people have the money to do it, you should always do your best to give them the best end product. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we always ask people to have it power washed or ready to go, especially if the wall requires repair. Right. Because we're not wall repair experts. And um, usually, though, usually things are ready. But, yeah, sometimes we show up and we're like, oh, I thought this wall surface was going to be something different because it was long distance. And, you know, you're right. traveling to get there and they're just sending you pictures and they're just telling you what they're telling you. Have you ever had that happen where you're just like totally surprised by what you have to deal I've, with? I've uh, I've turned down a couple walls before just based on where they were or even sometimes what they want to put on the wall maybe won't work there. Like um, yellows are really, really bad in the sun. Um, for whatever reason, yellow pigments just die out in the sun like very quick and turn into white. Mm -hmm. And so I've had a couple murals where people want me to do something outside that's variation of yellows. And I'm like, we just can't really do that. It'll look really good for a year, but then eventually it's gonna be this weird white wall. Even if you UV coat it, like eventually they start to fade pretty quick. And so I try to give people the best advice possible for the situation at hand and hope that they listen to you as an artist because you're also not, rec you don't have to do anything. Right. You know, that's right. Like, you don't do anything you don't want. If it do. if it feels bad, maybe don't do it. <laughs> that's a good general rule. Yeah, yeah. If if you're talking to somebody and all of a sudden you get this like icky feeling in the pit of your stomach, Run. something feels <laughs> off. Listen to that. That's your intuition. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. And I feel like a lot of times I know I have in the past, I've talked myself out of my intuition and then I end up in a place where I'm like, oh no, I should have just listened to myself. And so, yeah, intuition. <laughs> so I've been coaching this artist to um, get this project and she got the clients to agree. It's huge installation and it's yeah. multiple pieces of all this stuff um, in San Diego. And they agreed on a price, $52,000 is like her biggest project yet. And this, this muralist is just amazing. She's incredible. And she's very excited because it's the best, biggest project she's ever gotten. And they were sending her a deposit and she's waiting for the check and she's getting ready to go buy all the materials. And then she gets an email saying, well, we want, you know, we know you gave us 30% off, but we want 20% more off. And so I've been coaching her through how to handle that to say, okay, let's see where we can take some things away, right? right? Let's lessen the scope of work. Maybe, um, you know, she was going to do all these mock-ups in Photoshop. Just don't even do that. And maybe give them... 10% off because I we couldn't find where we could cut corners to give them 20% off. Right. And um, she didn't want to cut corners on the materials because this is going into a very uh, like a luxury building and you can't cut corners on that. Right. Have you run into situations like that where you had somebody agree to a price and then next thing you know, they're trying to backpedal yes, yes. <laughs> how and, do you and, handle that um differently every time <laughs> differently every time it kind of depends on who they are and kind of like you said like your intuition um i don't get a very good feeling when that starts to happen um because it you've already put time into their project right you've already been thinking about it you're already getting things ready you're writing up an estimate a proposal all these things and uh, I don't, you know, it's, there's people that I've done that with where, like you said, you lessen the scope of work, right? That is usually the best solution. But then there's some people too, where I'm not sure with her, are they wanting her to, they are refusing to change the scope of work or? Well, that's the part of, that's where she's at right now. So I don't know what they came back and told her yet. Okay. But I, I told her, I said, you gotta make it really clear to them that you looked at the project and looked for ways to save them money by cutting some things out. Right. And the best you could come up with without, without losing quality is to cut out the Photoshop work mm -hmm. and cut back on their number of sketch changes that they're allowed to make. Right. And that's only about 10% of a discount. You you couldn't find. So my point was you want to let them know you're trying to save them money, but you don't want to cut so many corners that their end result's not what they want. Right. Right. And I guess that's that's what I it makes me nervous when people kind of start doing that after you've already talked about it, because. I generally don't like giving discounts just in general, because especially I've heard it so many times from so many different places that I kind of have a bad taste in my mouth about it of, oh, we've got so many more projects for you. If you do this one at a discount, we're going to have five other murals or we know all these people and then you give them a discount and then you never hear from them again. And you're like, never, where is, I've yeah. never, ever, ever, <laughs> ever, never hear from them again. That Never. Is, I can't name one time in over 20 years that giving someone a discount brought me more business. And I, I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. I literally can't think of one time. Maybe it's happened. I just can't think of it. Um, yeah. But what I tell people is 
I'd love to give you a discount after this project. Our next project, I'm going to give you a discount. For sure. Yeah, no, that's the best thing. And that's the same. That's what I do as well is I can't give you a discount until we've done work together. Once we've done work together, I'd be happy to give you, uh, you know, and I do that with the people who buy my paintings and stuff as well. Like if you buy yeah. art from me then you get like a friends and family discount on my website and same thing, like we're friends now. You like my art. We've done business. You respect yeah. me. I respect you. Perfect. Like here's your yeah. discount. But yeah. Uh, yeah, that's hard. I feel I feel sorry for her a little bit, but also really excited for her because it sounds like a really cool project. So like, I totally understand that. And that's why getting those first like really big projects for you can be so scary and exciting. Yeah. Because you're willing to kind of do stuff that maybe you wouldn't normally be willing to do yeah. um, in order to get the project. And Well, and you learn so much. And I told her, I said, look, don't be disappointed that this is happening. Don't be frustrated. Look at this as a, as a learning opportunity. You are learning how to deal with people's objections and their requests. You're learning not to give them what they ask for. And you're learning how to frame the conversation in a way that they respect your time and they see you as a service provider. Right. It's all in the words that you use when yeah, you because, use. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you train your clients, right? Like yeah. In, in all industries, in every industry, like when I was in welding, it was the same thing. Like you let them know what to expect from you, you know, let them know how you do stuff. And when you don't do that, a lot of times you run into those problems where I just like when people ask for discounts and stuff, it makes me feel a little icky, you know? You're yeah, like, me too. You're like, oh, really? Like, <laughs> Well, and like she said, I already gave them the best possible price I could give them. Yeah. There's no, there's no wiggle room. And it trains them to think that because and I've had this happen before, too, where I did give somebody a discount. And then on the next one, they forgot that I had given them a discount and they're like, oh, that price is really high. What can you do? And I'm like, this is already the you already got the discount. There's no going down from here. And then right. like you said, then you don't hear from them again. Yep. All challenges. OK, so what is your best advice for a muralist out there who's maybe just learning to get better at the business of it um just practice your craft you know like the business side of everything is great and it's all super important but also like the reason that you're doing it is for the art too right so like you really do have to get out there and practice and paint and painting really big is completely different than painting small um i'm sure drew knows it's way different um it's super super fun but the way that you i do you, i'm not sure how he does his but like i would you know tell people to practice painting their things really big find a wall find a wall in your home you can paint the wall white again really easily you know um painting really big as a mural artist is something that you really do need to get down getting all your proportions right and all that stuff and there's so many tricks like if you're looking to do big murals, I recommend you look up videos on doing a scribble grid on YouTube. It's my favorite thing in the entire world. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're awesome. No, a scribble grid. A scribble grid. It's the best way to, um, if you don't have a projector, I know a lot of people project their work and stuff too, to help them get it all framed out. But Sometimes you don't have a projector that can project the 30 by 20 and you don't have the opportunity to go at night or project it. And you still need to make this little sketch that you made for somebody 30 feet tall. Um, a scribble grid is really awesome. It's basically you get your paint can and you draw scribbles all over the wall, little symbols, images. You can write your name a bunch of times. You can write the alphabet on the wall take a picture of it the same way you would do if you were going to make a regular rectangle grid and you overlay the photo of your sketch over that grid that you've made. And it makes it way easier than using a standard rectangle grid, because if you have rectangles on a giant 30 foot wall and you're looking at your reference photo and then looking at, you know, a hundred squares, you're going to get lost really fast trying to get that image onto the wall. But if you have, say, a star and a circle and a triangle and you project the image over it, you can see 
this, you know, person's arm goes through the tip of the circle, the point of the triangle, mm -hmm. this little S down here. And it's a lot easier for your eyes and for your brain to translate something into a really large um, surface. So any new mural artist, I 100% recommend looking up scribble grid techniques on YouTube because that will change your life in terms of going really, really big. That is brilliant. That is brilliant. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for all the info. And for everybody listening, if they want to find you, where is the best place to look at your work? Um, I have all my mural videos on my Instagram. It's Austin Art. It's spelled O-S-T-3-N-A-R-T. Um, that's my Instagram. You can find me on Facebook, Austin Art as well. Uh, my website, Austin, O-S-T-E-N dash art.com. Got all my prints and fun stuff like that on there. Um, thank you so much for having me, Maria. This is so much fun. Well, thank you. Thank you for, be willing, for being willing to share all this information. And you're so brilliant. And at such a young age, you figured out so much. And you have great attitude. And you're just very giving and... I just, I appreciate you so much. And I know that everybody listening does because I think uh, we all learned a lot from you <laughs> yeah. today. So thank you so much. And to all my listeners, check out the show notes below. I will have links to all of Austin's websites and Instagram, et cetera. And also check out my online mural course, which gives you a proposal and pricing templates that will help you out. All right. See you all later. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>